Patanjali De La Rocha is a queer indigenous survivor, doula and perinatal health educator, herbalist, activist, health equity consultant, and parent living in the, ooh, sorry about that, occupied Duwamish territory in Seattle, Washington. Can you hear me? They specialize in anti-oppressive organizational healing and decolonizing research by reclaiming evaluation and data through community-engaged practice. They're a founder of the Birth Beyond Bars, a community-based reproductive justice collective working with carcerally involved pregnant people. Locally, they have worked with several community nonprofits, including API Chaya, FOCS, Mother Nation, Perinatal Support Washington, Open Arms, Alphabet Alliance of Color, Queer the Land, and much more. They are currently a program director at Hummingbird Indigenous Family Services, overseeing the development and implementation of NEST, the first guaranteed income program nationally to work with indigenous communities. Welcome. Hey, um, is it still morning? Not quite. Um, good morning, y'all. Hi, it's so great to be here. Hello, everyone who's joining us virtually. Um, Yes, I'm really honored to be here with everyone today. Uh, it feels really grounding in the work because it can be so challenging. So I'm feeling really inspired by everyone here today um, and just grateful for the opportunity. Um, I'd like to take a moment to uh, ground us in a land and labor acknowledgement. Um, so to honor and acknowledge that America rests on the occupied ancestral lands of the indigenous peoples of the continent and the Massachusetts people um, in where we are today in Boston. Um, I'd like to honor that the original peoples are still here despite not having treaty rights honored or having yet to be justly compensated for their land resources and livelihood. And we must also acknowledge that America, including its culture, economic growth, and development throughout history and across time, has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans and their ascendants who suffered the horror of the transatlantic trafficking of their people, chattel slavery, and Jim Crow. We are indebted to their labor and their sacrifice, and we must acknowledge that the tremors of that violence throughout the generations and the resulting impact that can still be felt and witnessed today. So I'd like to take a moment to raise our hands to the resiliency, dedication, perseverance, and radical wisdom of those who have survived apocalypse and keep dreaming. Um, and I've put on the slides, I don't, I hopefully folks will be able to access them or they can be shared out later, but I just have the resources from which I compiled this, um, some links to uh, different uh, ways to get involved, um, to find out a relationship with your indigenous um, communities, because it's not enough to just acknowledge this reality, but it takes action and relationship building to help undo um, the legacies of genocide and slavery. Um, I was introduced, I'm so not used to being introduced, so that was really special. Um, <laughs> and so, yes, I come as a community-based organizer, as a parent. Um, I, it was my own experience with pregnancy and childbirth that inspired me to do doula work. Um, I was so grateful for Kay's presentation. Um, we were sharing a little bit afterwards, but literally going to postpartum support groups saved my life, and having the person who ran my support group I uh, paid to take me to a postpartum support group facilitator training and then I became a doula and I started working in my communities because I didn't want anyone to have to go through what I went through. Um, and then I uh, just was seeing the levels of institutional violence that were happening to people while they were trying to give birth and raise their families and I felt like being a doula, it was not enough for me to just hold someone's hand while they were being uh, violated. And so I went back to graduate school and I finished a dual degree in social work and public health. Um, and one of my mentors, Cami Goldhammer, um, who is incredible. If you don't know her, check her out. She's the founder of Hummingbird. Um, I did my practicum with her. She does an indigenous breastfeeding counselor training nationally, working at reservations, increasing rates of breastfeeding. And so I had meant, I had interned with her during my gr graduate study, and then she hired me on when she got funding to start this new guaranteed income program. And it is, yeah, it was such an honor to be here and doing this work, um, literally a dream job. Um, so yeah, Hummingbird Indigenous Family Services, um, we just founded as our own organization last year, um, but our doula program, which was previously with a different organization started 
in 2019, it's a full spectrum doula program. And we um, think of our indigenous doulas as aunties. Um, we stay with our families for <clears throat> a much longer. We do weekly home visits. Um, our doula program manager, Vanessa Lovejoy Garon, is incredible. Um, and we serve Native and Pacific Islander families. Uh, we are the first and only indigenous agency in the Tri-County area uh, surrounding Seattle um, that exclusively serves indigenous babies and families. Um, and this is an example of our orchard. Um, I might do a little walk thing too. Can I, where's that other mic? I, I just can't, I can't see my slides from here. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so part of the reason that Cami had this vision to found Hummingbird was wanting to not replicate a lot of the harms that we see in perpetuating colonial mindsets in developing our org. So in our org chart, you can see our community is in the center of all that we do, and we hold them accountable. Um, prior to forming the, the NEST, the, the Guaranteed Income Program, we created an elders council. So we have a group of elders who we consult in every step of development of this program. Our board are our clan mothers and our entire team has access to them. It's not just the executive director. Um, so we have our doula program. Um, we're starting a perinatal support Washington, um, which does uh, like postpartum support groups. We will have a peer support specialist. Uh, we're launching a home visiting program through the Family Spirit Program, which is an evidence-based curriculum. Um, and then the NEST, uh, which I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, so hummingbird values. Um, we believe that every parent is the perfect parent for their baby, that healthy mothers and babies are the foundation of a healthy community. We believe that abundance and generosity are essential in indigenous resili resiliency. Um, and that abundance and generosity are a community responsibility. We believe in the validity of traditional knowledge in centering indigenous people in all our work and in the importance of providing culturally relevant care. And at the center of all this with this guaranteed income program and in all the work that we do is we want indigenous mothers to believe that they're enough, right? Just by existing, just by being here, you don't have to do anything to prove that you're a good parent, that you ex just by existing and being here, you, you are enough and deserving of care. Um, and so we, I mentioned we started our elders council and in our process of creating this, we went through a formative evaluation process with the Urban Indian Health Institute, which is a leader in decolonizing data nationally across Indian health services. And we created, we had a team of about 18 um, indigenous and Pacific Islander women who'd been pregnant in the past three years. And we met with them through uh, focus groups, interviews, surveys, um, and a four-hour design sprint um, where we collectively developed the program and we compensated all of them for their time and participation because we wanted to know, we wanted to make sure that people knew that they were valued and because there's so much stigma and bias from receiving social supports and welfares, when we're talking about giving people money, we didn't want to make it stigmatizing, um, we wanted to make sure people felt seen, valued, and welcomed at every step of the process. Um, and I wanted to pause and take a minute to ground us in this idea of indigenous evaluation and decolonizing data, um, because evaluation is something that's often been weaponized against indigenous and black communities. And, um, but it is, evaluation is something that indigenous people have always done. It's part, uh, it's an indigenous value. The image up here is a cradle board, which is a traditional safe, is the traditional sleep method. And it meets all of today's standards for safe sleep. Um, right. And that's not an accident, right? That's, that's evaluation right there that created this perfect design sleep method. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the NAS, so what is it? Um, so it's going to be a guaranteed income program, which means that it's a monthly no strings attached stipend that will be provided from pregnancy until a child's third birthday. Um, we're aiming right now, the number is uh, $1,250 a month uh, for up to 150 families. Um, so you have to be, yeah, Native American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, or indigenous to North America. Um, we have extended, we say pregnancy, but because we know that there are really low rates of prenatal care in our communities and really high rates of um, preterm birth, we extended that to six weeks postpartum to make sure that we can capture those folks as well. 
Uh, right now, the funding is for serving folks living in King County, and there's a few local reservations surrounding King County that people living on those reservations will be um, available. Uh, these services will be available to them. And um, it is no strings attached, so people can literally come to us if they meet our qualification criteria. They can just take the money, never talk to us again. But people can also opt into our doula services, um, perinatal health education, and a leadership development program. And there's the optional participation in our research with UIHI and a uh, storytelling project for narrative and policy change work. We, we're a strengths-based program. We don't often like to focus on the disparities and the negative health outcomes, but I think it is really important to ground us a little bit in that uh, so we can understand what the landscape that we are talking about. There's a lot of information here so um, that you can go over afterwards, but it's really important to note we have really high infant mortality rate. Um, it's at about 12% in King County, and it's important to note that in our doula program, we have a, we have a 4%. Um, oh, sorry, preterm birth. Our preterm birth is 12% uh, in King County, and it, for our doula program, it's only 4%. No, no infant mortality in our doula program. Um, uh, poverty rate, even though indigenous people make up less than 2% of overall population in King County, we're <clears throat> over half of people living at 200% below the poverty line. Um, we have lo younger maternal age, higher rates of preterm birth, higher rates of lack of access to prenatal care. Um, and Native children are more likely to be involved in child protective services, um, more likely to be unhoused, and there's really high rates of gender-based violence in our communities. And again, I really want to ground us in that this is a legacy of racism and genocide. This isn't inherently anything to do with our communities. And you'll note on the slides, um, for instance, uh, it says infant mortality, the AIAN rate is more than three times that than beneficiaries of structural racism. This is something that the Urban Health Institute has adopted, Urban Indian Health Institute has adopted. So instead of saying non-Hispanic whites um, as a comparison group, uh, UIHI names those communities as beneficiaries of structural racism because structural racism is the normalization and legitimization of dynamics of those dynamics, including historical, cultural, institutional, and interpersonal um, that advantage white people while producing cumulative and chronic adverse health outcomes for other communities of color. So we have adopted that additionally. So. And again, so we name these things to root them in these ideas of indigenous erasure, that these disparities are the reflection of that genocide, right? Treaty rights not upheld, removal from lands, boarding schools, migration into urban centers, and illegalization. Um, much of, like, our, <laughs> it's not a policy accident, right? Like, these are, these are, um, intentional policies that were created to uphold white supremacy culture. And so our programming works to undo these legacies of colonization and targeted practices. Uh, we also ground ourselves in the values of reproductive justice. Uh, reproductive justice recognizes that race is a social construct and that racism creates and maintains the conditions and positions of community colors that we, communities of color that we bear the collateral consequences that are manifested in health disparities. Um, it also recognizes that there, um, the, the invisible labor of mother work and the reproductive labor that goes so far beyond ensuring the survival of um, people's families. Um, so we use, these, we use these frameworks in developing our program. Um, and I want to take a moment to also center us in the lineage of guaranteed income pilots. So uh, the, I, I have listed up here the Abundant Birth Project and Magnolia's Mother's Trust, which are two guaranteed income programs that center black women um, and whose lineage we are a part of in developing this. We've been working closely with Dr. Zaya from the Abundant Birth Project and contacted them to help develop our program. There's also Baby's First Years, um, which is in... Minnesota, I believe, and is a state-funded project, and the Bridge Project is a private one in New York, and all, uh, working with 
immigrant mothers. So these are all programs that are targeting pregnancy. Um, and we believe that working during this time is an intersectional approach that's working to not only heal, right, like the, the intergenerational and historical trauma of everything that's come before that our ancestors didn't have the time to heal, but also working toward the future to um, have potential impacts for that child's life across the lifespan. Um, and this is a quote from one of our participants in the listening session um, that's talking about honoring the sacredness of pregnancy. And also, um, we, they, this was a response to, you know, how do you think this income would impact your life? And this idea of being able to unapologetically parent was something that came up over and over again, that the idea of having just basic needs met would create that space to just be themselves, parent, and be recognized as someone who's multifaceted. Um, so for this program and in Hummingbird, we believe in program sovereignty, so not just only like data sovereignty, um, gener like moving within that. Program sovereignty is this idea that all of our staff can build and develop programs within their own vision, but also that it's centering the sovereignty of our community. Um, with this principle of intergenerational transformation, which I talked a little bit about before, and the wheel of sacred belonging, which is something that we created in collaboration with our elder council. We're an inter tribal organization working with a large urban native community, and so it's in a appropriate to draw from any one tribal tradition. So we work together with our elders, council, um, and our community members to create this wheel of sacred belonging that grounds, um, that grounds our program values. Um, for babies to develop, they need fat, sleep, and affection. And so we're hoping that this guaranteed income will just support all of those things for cuddles to be had, for milk to be made, and for parents to just get to honor that sweet time, postpartum time together. Um, so the goals of our guaranteed income program aim to support the biological design of early childhood development. Um, how am I doing on time? Here's another quote uh, from our listening session. So talking about uh, the potential of lowering rates of uh, domestic or gender-based violence in the house. Uh, we know that rates of gender-based violence tend to increase during pregnancy, and so having more financial stability could potentially mitigate that. And uh, I'll, I'm gonna go in a little bit to uh, the evaluation design of our program. Um, so the, we used an indigenous evaluation framework that was co-designed with our community. It's resilience and strengths based, so focusing on what are the assets that our community has, what are the things that we're doing right, the reasons why we're all still here after 500 years of genocide, um, centering community, decolonizing data, um, thinking about that slide I shared before with the numbers. We also know that those numbers are highly, um, that they're not accurate because of the way that data is coded, because of indigenous erasure, that the numbers are often much lower than the true, true numbers, just because um, of what Abigail Echohawk, the founder of UIHI, calls uh, data genocide, um, right? Because if we're not in the numbers, then we're not getting funded. Um, and community is created wherever Native people are. So there's not like one ideal, but we're actively co-creating culture and community as a living thing. Um, and for us specifically, right, doula work, breastfeeding, parenting, those are all cultural values. They're not necessarily medical practices. Um, and again, here's one, another participant quote talking about this idea of cultural connectedness, of being able to speak their language. And these are things that we think about, again, moving beyond the numbers, as Kay was saying in that last presentation, and thinking about, like, what is the first language that you want your child to hear when you enter, when they enter into this world? You know, what are the experiences that we want folks to have? And being able to support people um, to know who they are and where they come from. And so our planned evaluation for this program, and again, participants in the, in the Guaranteed Income, which we're aiming to launch in May, we're hoping for a Mother's Day launch uh, to get money in hands by that day, May of 2023. 
Um, and so, so folks can just receive the money and not opt into the evaluation, but we're hoping it'll have this four-pronged approach that is looking at the process of the program, so how it's working, constantly reevaluating and re-implementing re our services based on feedback from community. Um, relational, looking at the impact of the guaranteed income on family, community, infant bonding, and cultural connectedness. Um, looking at the impact on the entire family, which includes like outcomes, parenting relationships, economic status, um, and then also the narrative impact. Guaranteed income work is narrative change work, thinking about the stigma of poverty, changing the idea of poverty as like a moral failing to one as a policy choice that we can change um, and one that's rooted in legacies of civil rights movements and racial justice. Um, so the narrative change work will be co-developed by community to help um, with like media and policy work. And here is another quote thinking about folks' ability to save for the future and save for their children, kind of countering that idea that, well, the kind of racist undertone ideas that people will spend their money irresponsibly, they don't know what's best for them, those sorts of things. So here's a mother who's already saving uh, for her family um, and thinking about ways that we can be saving. We're also aiming for our program participants to start to start a 529 college fund for every family that participates in our program. Um, so at a glance, um, I know there's a lot of information to go over and I'll take questions afterwards. I'm trying to cram everything into a 30 minute talk. Um, so yeah, for eligibility, I'll say now too, for our doula program, we don't ask too many questions, folks just, register, we take their word for it, they get a doula, uh, right, wanting to make it as easy as possible. Um, but for this program, because it's, um, and this was something that was code developed and insisted on by our community members too, is that we need to go through some more rigorous verification process because there are people who will try to get access to this money who aren't pregnant, who don't live in King County, who aren't indigenous. And so what are ways that we can protect this money um, to keep it within our community without policing people's identities and making it feel as accessible as possible. Um, so for the eligibility criteria, folks have to be living in King County, pregnant and planning to parent. Um, currently we're using area median income as our cutoff, which in Seattle is $100,000 a year, um, though our funder may want to change that a little bit. Um, and for folks to apply, we're doing applications through community partners. We have robust relationships with uh, Pacific Island Health Board, Seattle Indian Health Board, and lots of other community partners working with Native communities. And as one way to be able to verify identity without forcing people to prove that they're Native enough, we want to enroll through community partners so there's this level of being vouched by community. Um, and then after that, uh, asking folks for verifying their identity through either a descendancy tree, if they have an enrollment card, great, um, and through our interview and intake process. And then once folks are enrolled in the program, they'll be onboarded, provided with benefits counseling. This is a huge piece for lots of guaranteed income programs is ensuring that the income that we're giving folks isn't going to make them ineligible for any social services that they're not going to be receiving currently. So providing benefits, counseling, talking to folks about that potential negative impact and giving them the choice to decide if they still want to enroll. And then the uh, option to work uh, with our other programs, be referred out to doula services, childbirth education, or other community partner programs. And then lastly, I think we have our, uh, another quote talking about building the village. So with, with our wraparound services, we're hoping to do more than just provide folks with a guaranteed income, but rebuild, rebuild the village, rebuild community, and make people like, feel connected and not so isolated during this pivotal time in life. So we're also, uh, as part of our narrative change work, and because invisibility is a key function in maintaining structural, uh, structural oppression, we're going to be conducting a storytelling project alongside this program. 
So we'll be uh, filming a documentary following a small number of program participants. Again, all of this will be additionally compensated for folks who are participating in the storytelling. We'll be holding a yearly artist residency program. Uh, so contracting with one, a different artist, a native or Pacific Islander artist a year to do storytelling. And that could be weaving, that could be drawing, that could be dance, that could be writing birth stories. Um, whatever folks feel called to them to reclaim traditional practices around the perinatal period. And then we will be doing a social media campaign that's created and led by Indigenous Mamas and maybe a few different smaller ones a year, but that was something in our um, design sprint that Mamas were like, we need TikToks, like that's how people are gonna learn. So I'm, I'm an old millennial, I was like, I don't know TikTok, but I'll learn for this. Um, and so, yeah, I, Thinking about this impact on intergenerational impacts of um, the guaranteed income, right? When mamas are happy, babies are happy. And by intervening at this really pivotal time in families' lives, we're hoping that we'll be able to impact folks across the lifespan and for future generations to come. I think something that can be really challenging with these types of interventions, it's like this is five years, but we're talking about undoing hundreds of years of colonization, and you can't really measure. The things that we want to measure aren't necessarily measurable by current funding opportunities and trends, and so we can't give the evidence for what this will do. Um, but I, I guess I have a story of a friend who they weren't raised traditionally by, when, by their family, but when they were born, their grandmother sent a little satchel with some corn in it to them. And then as an adult, they became the one in their family. They didn't know the story. And then they became the one in their family to start reclaiming and living that way. And it wasn't until after she did that that her mom told her that story, right? And so she's like, oh, it's because my grandma sent me this traditional food when I was a baby. That's why I'm doing this now as an adult. So the right there's those kinds of intangible stories of the meaning of connection and the ways that that changes us that we can't really measure through um, traditional outcomes, but right, we know, we know it works. And I think, I think that's all I got for you today. I know I rushed through it a little bit, uh, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. Hey. <laughs> Can you pass the mic over? Oh, um, greetings, my name is Chanel Porsche Albert and I'm the founder of Ancient Song. And uh, my question is how does, um, with the qualifications that folks have to go through, how does that impact um, indigenous communities that are, may not necessarily be federally recognized um, in the path for gaining access? So what, I mean, have you all taken that into consideration and what would be the qualifications for them. Yeah, so we don't we don't require any kind of tribally federally recognized tribes at all currently for any of our programs and so for this, you know, if folks are enrolled then they can show their tribal card, but we're using also descendancy trees so folks just map out their lineage and show like, oh, this is where my great grandfather came from this tribe, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So no no federal requirements. We recognize the harms in that, but that that's you know, for our doula program, we don't ask folks. We don't do anything. We just trust them. But this was something, you know, we're talking about $15,000 a year. And so we just want to make sure that there aren't folks who are not Native who are coming to claim that money. Um, yeah. No, I can totally. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. My name is Sior. I'm from Marcha Tufts, um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little about the construction of the Cultural Advisory Board. Um, it sounds like a huge effort, so I was wondering kind of what were the logistics um, in terms of um, picking the right people to be represented on the board um, and, you know, continuously running the board. Yeah, I think we're a little, even though we're a really new organization, our executive director, Cami Goldhammer, she's been doing this work in Indian country for over 15 years and so has really deep established relationships in communities. So she reached out to her direct elders 
um, and ask them to come together. So they represent folks who have not only elder status in their communities and tribes, but also um, have expertise in perinatal health, infant mortality, um, their doctors, their aunties, their doulas. Um, two of them are former doula clients of ours. Um, so I think uh, for us, it, because those relationships were already established, it wasn't that hard to put it all together. Um, we currently meet once a month to go over that guide. It was bi-weekly, now it's once a month. And as we move into program launch, we're wanting to add a, a few direct community members to the program and expand it a little bit. And it will become a more decision-making process for when there are those tricky decisions like verifying identity or say someone's child gets uh, removed by CPS or someone becomes incarcerated to handle those situations for like, okay, does that mama keep receiving payment for how long? How do we help them transition? Um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, mine is a comment and maybe a question. I don't know where we'll end up. But uh, I love that you're doing this work. And I feel like it's something that's really needed in many other places. I know for sure it's needed in Texas. But what you said about where there's no data, you know, it's like no, there's no funding and there's no... Um, no one's trying to come up with solutions if you're not, you know, in the data, at least. So I just wanted to acknowledge and appreciate that. And I know Texas doesn't have data for our indigenous community, or at least didn't. Mm -hmm. Currently, Texas is hiding its data, so I don't know if it doesn't. But it didn't whenever we last got data. Um, so yeah, I just find your work is so important. I do you ah here's a question do you do you see this same question probably do you see this expanding out from here local um yeah thank you for that and thank you for the work you're doing in texas too um because that seems like such a challenging place to be doing this work and yeah so hands up to you as well for the work you're doing um for guaranteed income, it's a relatively move, new movement, but I think with the child tax credit that was released during the pandemic, right? Like that was kind of the first time federally we got basically a guaranteed income. So there's been a push where there's now over a hundred different guaranteed income pilots happening right now across the state. And we're a part of that and we're lucky that we get to build off of the work that's already come. So we're not designing this program from scratch. Uh, I think right now we're just working on trying to get this program off the ground. I think it would be amazing to expand right now. It's a pilot, but we're working. It's a pri privately funded pilot, but we're working with state legislators to help pass legislation for there's a movement in Washington state for a statewide guaranteed income that would be dispersed through community based organizations and we're applying for some federal funding to keep this going as well. So we'd like to see this continue, um, of course. And if anyone here is feeling inspired and like, I wanna do this in my area, I'm so happy to give you resources, support, um, offer guidance because um, it may or may not be surprising depending where you're at. It is very, very hard to just give people money. You know, it sounds like a really seemingly simple concept, but if you just wanna give people money, we make it very difficult in America to do that. Oh, like expanding those programs? Yeah, we are excited. So right now we have two doulas. Next year we hope to expand to have at least four doulas. Um, we're waiting to hear about funding to start a lactation program. Um, lactation is our director's passion. And so um, we've always wanted to do one at Hummingbird, and so we're hoping, yeah, we're gonna call it Project Nectar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have so much fun with the hummingbird, like this is the nest, and we looked it up, a group of hummingbirds, you can call it a shimmer, or a hover, or a glitter, so we have, a, we're like, do we call our elder council a glitter of hummingbirds? I don't know, <laughs> a glitter of elders, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Is that it? Any other questions? No? Okay. We'll go ahead and break for lunch at this time. Thank you so much for that presentation. And we'll be back around 1.15 um, for our next presenter.